Uh, okay, our next speaker is Dr. Matthew Parrish from uh, Université de Montréal and Mila. Um, Dr. Parrish is an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the uh, Université de Montréal in Montreal. He previously did his PhD at Northwestern University in Chicago and postdoctoral uh, fellowships at the Econ School of Medicine at uh, Mount Sinai in New York City and the University of Geneva in Switzerland. His research program fuses AI and computational neuroscience with experimental neurophysiology and neural engineering to study how biological brains coordinate motor behaviors and ultimately guide the development of next generation neuroprosthetic devices for rehabilitation. And today, Matt is going to talk to us about merging neural and behavioral modularity through brain-wide compositional modes. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Right. Great. It's, uh, very nice to be here after a couple of years of joining virtually. It feels good to actually be here in person. This is a very stimulating meeting. So thanks to other organizers for inviting me. And, you know, it's the Montreal AI neuroscience meeting. I'm going to forewarn you, this will be squarely on the neuroscience side. But I did want to open with a slide where I kind of lay out some of the logic for why I think a lot of these ideas could be relevant for AI. And in that perspective, you know, brains are extremely good at learning and adapting to new scenarios, making one or zero shot generalizations, you know, dealing with very uh, unpredictable and changing statistics. And they do this extremely efficiently, very low energy expenditure, very minimum training time, these sorts of things. And of course, these are problems that everyone is trying to solve in AI, but it's very hard whenever you have changing statistics, set of domain generalization, et cetera. So I'm probably preaching to the choir. It's natural to try to look to the brain for inspiration on how we can get better at solving these kinds of problems. And of course, you could pick any number of evolutionary solutions that the brain has found to allow these types of, of adaptations. I'm going to focus on one for the purpose of this talk is this idea of modularity, which you know a lot of people have thought about, a lot of people have talked about, and this appears in many ways, right? There's cell types that appear in different parts throughout the brain. There's mot organizational motifs or like you know cortical layers and these types of organizations. And then at the higher level, you have things like specialized brain regions. You know you can define them anatomically, you can define them functionally. And the idea is that somehow these kinds of uh, innate specializations are kind of giving the brain the inductive biases, giving brains the flexibility, kind of pre-programming enough stuff where we can do all these complex behavioral tasks uh, quite innately and quite adeptly. So the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on this idea of brain regions. And there's been some work in AI of doing like region-like uh, inspirations uh, to build models, you know, the CNNs for the visual pathways, for example, or different attention-based models uh, that get some prefrontal cortex-like things. Um, and if we were to look at uh, like neuroscience and say, okay, you want some inspiration, I'm primarily an experimentalist, I do recordings from, from primates. And if I say, okay, I want to study some regions, here's a four region organism, and maybe each of these region, regions does something different. You have the vision region, the language region, some emotion region, a movement region. And I want to understand these. So the pipeline kind of goes like this. So I kind of put some electrodes in and define each region specialization. Then I say, okay, we have this brain pretty well mapped out. So then the next step would be to say, well, now I just have to learn how these things communicate. And then we can understand how this brain produces these behaviors. And essentially you could rephrase this as we're kind of really trying to look at these regions as some kind of compositional basis that could explain the types of behavioral flexibility that these organisms are, are giving. And what do I mean by this composition, compositional basis? I'm really drawing a lot on like a semantic type of interpretation of this. So if think about language. We have the sentence, in the garden, the boy rose to pick the rose. Each of these words maybe is something you're trying to assemble composi comp compositionally, but there's this ambiguity, right? So the word rose here means a different thing than the word rose here. One is a flower, one is an action. So you really need this grammatical structure to disambiguate the possible rules of the module rose in this sentence. So if we think about brain regions as modules, then it begs the question of what is the grammar of the brain in this way? Like, what is this overarching compositional structure that lets you interpret the region of this activity? Because motor cortex may send some commands to the spinal cord, which makes a muscle contract. The context of doing that to run away from a predator or the context of doing that to point this laser pointer are very different, right? 
So you need this kind of overarching structure in order to really understand these, these the functions of these regions as they pertain to the behavior we want to produce. And you know, earlier there was mentioned like the claustrum or the, the frontotemporal junction. And you know, it's nice to say, oh, does the claustrum cause consciousness? But it only does anything in the context of all of the rest of the brain. So some sort of like grammar-like structure is, is really what we need to start looking for. Okay, so how do we think about this? So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on uh, larval zebrafish, which I think we've now clarified are definitely not conscious. And these zebrafish are kind of born with some behavioral repertoire. And they have some behavioral states. Maybe they swim, maybe they rest, maybe they search for food. And when they choose to enter into these different behavioral states is a product of a lot of different processes. There is some internal drive or motivation, signals like hunger, you know, their environmental inputs, do I see a predator or not, et cetera. So you can think of then of these states as being an actual temporal sequence over time, right? In the life of a zebrafish, you go through these different things as these internal processes play off each other. You look for food when you're hungry, you escape from the predator when you see the fish, et cetera. Now, I know this is a straw man, but I think a lot of neuroscientists implicitly adopt this kind of view where we say, oh, if I wanna understand the hunger, then I go to the hunger region. And when the fish is hungry, then I should see the hunger region lighting up and therefore, I'm now understanding how the fish got hungry, et cetera. And you do that when the fish is escaping a predator, and you do that with the movement. You know, you, you just kind of do this discretized breakdown, which, of course, we know isn't really true, right? Because all of these underlying processes are, are, are continuous, and there's all this contextual information that you, that you miss here. So what we really want is something that allows us to be a bit more compositional with how we assign, like, uh, stitch all of these region activities together. And... You know, what this could look like is you're no longer just a region doing something, but with some time course that we ideally would want to match to these uh, kind of behavioral internal processes, there should be sort of patterns of source and target interactions between different parts of the brain that are kind of behaviorally specialized. And a lot of this is also saying that behavior itself being modular, there should be some correspondence of a view of neuromodularity that maps on to these types of behavioral modularity, but we're not gonna see that strictly anatomically. So how do we find this kind of structure? I'm gonna put forth a kind of an idea in a pipeline to look for exactly this kind of structure in the brain. And of course, I'm not gonna tell you what the grammar of the brain is, You know, the Nobel Prize Committee can hold their phone calls. But I do think that I can at least show that there is some kind of global structure that we could be studying and that we could learn from in terms of uh, trying to understand how these brain-wide circuits generate behavior. So this is collaboration with the experimentalist uh, Karl Dazeroth's lab at Stanford. So Tyler Benster and Aaron Andaman did a lot of the recordings. It's also a collaboration with my former mentor, uh, Kanika Rajan at Mount Sinai in New York. And essentially, this is the easiest type of uh, paradigm you can imagine. So these are calcium recordings, uh, calcium imaging from larval zebrafish. And larval, zebra, larval zebrafish are this really fascinating uh, animal model because when they're like five or six days old, their skin is actually essentially translucent. So you can genetically label all the neurons in the brain such that whenever that neuron is active with the calcium channels, it gives off light. And then you don't even have to open up the fish. You just put a camera on top, you see through the skin and you can record massive amounts of neurons spanning the entire brain. So it's a great model for asking these really large scale questions about multi-regional coordination leading to, to behavior. And there was a wonderful paper that you could go read about uh, stress and depression that they published in Cell about three years ago. Most of what I'm gonna show you here is actually the control group from that paper. So this is a group of fish that they said, well, we want a null model to compare all these other manipulations to. So these fish, they went in their little agar plate, the camera went on their head and they sat there for an hour and the experiment ended. So you would think this purely spontaneous kind of behavior, like how do we find structure here? How do we actually really begin to interpret the kinds of patterns that I was, that I was talking about in the intro? And while they're doing this, you can record a lot of the brain. I call it whole brain. It's not every neuron. It's maybe like 15% of the total neurons, but we sample from almost every region to some extent. So we get order of like 15,000 neurons on each of these experiments. And I'll give you an example of what this data looked like. So this is a recording over about an hour, maybe like 48 minutes actually. And here just coarsely defined the telencephalon, this cortex like blob here at the front of the fish. And this is just the activity of all of these neurons is about three to 4,000 here as a function of time. 
And every time you see the, the red dots, that's basically those neurons being active. So if you look at that, you say, well, I don't learn anything from this. This is useless. So you say, okay, let's do some population analysis, dimensionality reduction, people like looking at PCA trajectories, et cetera. So if I basically run PCA across this, this population and project it into the first three principal components, I get this. Okay, maybe I'm getting more. I mean, it looks like you kind of trace an hour long arc and there's some bursts, but I'm also not learning that much. Okay, well, maybe the telencephalon is not that interesting. So I go look at a bunch of other regions and here's about eight more, so nine total. We've got the habenula, the raphe nucleus, the different thalamus, some other motor regions. And, you know, you kind of can read the tea leaves however you want, right? You sort of see everything. You see slow dynamics, you see fast dynamics. What's really interesting is that if I just look at these heat maps, a lot of these regions look really similar. Like the brain of this fish is actually not that interesting. Like maybe we don't even have a lot of these functional specializations. Like I, if I just look at this block here and this block here, I couldn't tell you which one was the telencephalon, which was the dorsal thalamus a priori, right? I need those labels. Yet when you look at kind of this underlying population dynamics, you can actually see a lot of difference between the trajectories you're taking in the telencephalon versus say the trajectories down here or up here in like the, the ventral habenula compared to the raphe nucleus, et cetera. So there is something going on, but the data is immense, it's complex. How do we make sense of this? And this is where I think computational modeling becomes very important. And this is building on some work I did a few years ago with Konica, where we were trying to develop a method explicitly to model and extract structure in these large scale multi-regional neural recordings. And we called this current-based decomposition or CURB. And the idea of CURB is that you can think of the brain as just a recurrent neural network, right? It's a, it's a pretty good model, misses a lot of things, it abstracts it away, but it's a pretty good model. And if you have some RNN, then you can define the connections between each of these units as some weight matrix, which basically tells you the strength of the interactions between each source neuron and each target neuron. And in a very simple kind of trivial way, you could describe the activity of any of these target neurons essentially just as a weighted sum of the activity of the source neurons. You're kind of reconstructing the activity in this, in this pseudo-linear way with some nonlinear filters. So all I have to do is think about now this whole brain as being essentially the same idea, right? It's still one highly interconnected RNN. So we can still write a connection matrix between all these possible regions and give it this kind of block structure, where if you look at the weights in this upper left corner, it's essentially all the region A neurons talking to region A neurons. In this upper right corner, it's all the region C neurons talking to other region A neurons, et cetera. And as long as we have this matrix, we can basically use this kind of linear de pseudo decomposition principle to actually decompose the activity of any of these regions into this sum of the constituent possible sources. So here, if there's these three regions and we're looking, let's say these are their dynamics, we can take the region A and actually decompose it into a weighted sum of inputs that might be from region B, region C, into region A, et cetera just by restricting this summation along the relevant subblocks from each of these regions. So this is the general idea of curved. Now, the problem is how do we get this matrix? You know, ideal, if you had the beautiful connectome and you could map every synapse, maybe you could get a really nice experimental functional estimate. We don't really have access to it at that scale experimentally at this point in time for most model systems. So instead we use more RNN modeling. And the idea now is to use what we call data-driven RNNs which are directly constrained to actually reproduce the experimental data recorded. So you could kind of think of this fish brain as basically we're just taking an in silico model of all of the neurons we record as an RNN. And how does this look like? If, our, if we have this data, this is like eight random neurons from recorded from the fish, their calcium transients. We kind of want in theory to make this RNN, which reproduces those exact dynamics so we could infer the interactions between neurons that might have given rise to that original recording. And we just do this directly using a variant of recursively squares where we iteratively to go a long time and just constrain with an error function for the uh, activity of each RNN unit to minimize the error between each uh, experimentally recorded neuron. So in a fish data set with 15,000 neurons, I'd instantiate a randomly connected 15,000 unit RNN and then train those weights iteratively until the RNN just gives you the experimental data. And the point of that exercise is that you do get this weight matrix that would cover all of the connections between these different possible neurons. Now, implicit in this is we're assuming that this RNN, this multi-region brain-wide circuit is a dynamical system. So we're predicting with this RNN update role, the next time step using the current time step. 
And if we only learn one matrix, that just means we're assuming that these dynamics are fixed and stable, but that's not what happens in real scenarios, right? You, the, you get a new input, you get hungry, the predator comes. These can actually be state changes in the behavior of the animal, which could correspond to different state changes in the dynamics you would see in these neurons. So we kind of coarsely get around this with something we call chaining, where we essentially discretize the data set and then sequentially train these networks at different time steps in order, and then piece them back together to assemble the whole data set. So over an hour, we actually can allow there to be a lot of flexible changes in the interaction between these neurons by actually using, say, eight different RNNs fit to different points in time and then comparing them. Does that all make sense? So that's kind of the, the methods of what I'm gonna show you. And I can give you an example of kind of how this looks. So if I take one of these data sets here, this is five fish, and this is like a chi-square error, training error essentially, as a number of iterations. What we see is that for all five fish, as we're training these networks, and keep in mind, this is, you know, five to 15,000 neurons. These are very big, very large data sets. We sort of see this reduction in training performance and a lot of plateau. And if we let it run another thousand iterations, I'm sure it would get even flatter, et cetera. Uh, and how does this look? This is the similar heat map like I showed before. This was the data we were looking at. And then this is the RNN fit. So visually almost indistinguishable. And if we look at individual neuron fits, this is a few sample calcium transients over time. The red is the RNN, the black is the data. You know, maybe we missed some of the high frequency jitter, but we actually captured the dynamics of these, these neural data pretty well. And you can also see this in a population trajectory through the first three PCs where the black line is the data and the red is the RNN. Okay, so we've kind of built these RNNs that fit this data. And from this, we get this interaction matrix, which we can now begin to reverse engineer. And so here's an example stretched out in time that we were looking at before. This is all the neurons over time. And, you know, I said we did this chaining thing. So I broke this up essentially into eight blocks. So there's going to be eight RNNs. And for each of those eight RNNs, we can look at the weights between each of these regions. And just as an example of how we can quantify this, this is a kind of a heat map showing an excitatory inhibitory balance. So whenever, whenever we fit these S with these weights, we can estimate whether, you know, the habenula to the RAFE has a net excitatory or net inhibitory sort of interaction strength and how strong that is. And it looks kind of like this, where you have nine regions as sources, nine regions as targets. And, you know, you see, we see basically not too much structure here, right? There's a few strong excitatory ones, a few kind of medium ones, et cetera. But then we can do this for each of those eight blocks. And we start to see some really interesting structure emerging. So this is an average across five fish, but all individuals kind of show the same pattern. Where as this experiment's going on, you know, there's no experiment here, really. The fish is just sitting in this apparatus, spontaneously whipping his tail, wondering why he's not really moving because there's a giant camera attached to his head. And we see this kind of really progressive structure emerging where overall the network sort of begins to die out a little bit, get less excitatory. And we see this like mutual self-inhibition emerging for a lot of like regions like the thalamus, et cetera, which is quite notable given its role in like motor control and sensory motor processing and all these relays throughout the brain. And what I, what I think is really interesting about this is because this is kind of a brain-wide functional view into what's happening to this fish. And this was the control group for another experiment. So already now this whole experiment is, is essentially confounded, right? Because this is all being built upon some almost spontaneously changing network that is somehow in a, you know, uh, vaguely tied into behavior we can't observe of some internal states of the fish because we can't ask the fish if he's hungry or not, right? So is, am I setting us up for some kind of like horrible failure and we're about to run into a wall? So what I wanna say next is that I think that actually we can find a lot more structure in this than I expected. And I'm sure that most people would expect. And you know, explanation as a satisfactory way of saying what this internal structure is, I think we'll take another, another step of experiments but I can at least say that all hope is not lost for the future. And so how what's this pipeline, right? So I brought up this idea of like compositionality where we wanna find ways in which you're kind of combining different regions for different temporally specific types of behavior that could kind of match this neural and, and behavior modularity. So that was sort of saying, if this was really what's underlying these behavioral states, can we find some patterns in the brain uh, that, that sort of have a similar type of signature with specific regions talking to other specific regions or neurons for the different types of internal things we could be observing. 
So the pipeline that we're going to use to try to estimate this is, is quite simple in the end once you have this RNN, right? So we fit this RNN to the data. We did the double chaining over time. So now we can span this very massively longitudinal hour long recordings. And we did this current de base decomposition. So I didn't go too in depth into what this looks like, but it essentially means taking this matrix that we've inferred, multiplying the presynaptic activity, and then summing to get the possible inputs to all of the different target neurons, right? And from that, you could think of it as you're no longer just looking at activity firing rates of a neuron over time. You're actually now looking at a tensor like object where for any given target neuron, you could write its activity in terms of a weighted sum of all of the possible source neurons and the activity of those over time. So in much the same way, then we might use factor analysis or PCA or something just to look at some sort of latent structure. We can now use tensor decomposition methods, which give us rank one basis sets that describe this current tensor here. And this actually starts, turns out to be very powerful and actually quite like what we'd want because what this basically says is that because you have a rigid time axis, any possible source target structure you find is kind of innately constrained along this specific temporal dimension. And it essentially looks like what I'm drawing here in cartoon up there. So what is this kind of, well, one tiny methodological detail. If you have 15,000 neurons, this tensor takes up a couple hundred gigabytes. So in order to make it actually run on a, on a non-massive computer, I do a little pre-functional clustering for the very low dimensional dynamics that I'm studying in these, in these fish, it basically I saw no difference no matter how, how much I discretized this. So what I'm gonna show you is essentially a hundred clusters that I kind of condensed this, uh, like dimensionally reduced this, this, this tensor into. Okay, so that's kind of the logic here is, as I was saying, like in much of the way that we would look at maybe the activity of neurons over time and find do some dimensionality reduction and find some manifold, you know, here I draw it as a flat plane, it could be any kind of nonlinear surface, but the idea is that you're looking for latent structure that could explain this bigger population thing. Here we're doing the same exact intuition, but the idea is to find these source and target pairs. So whenever, what does this look like in an actual fish? This is kind of an example of the output. So it's an optimization algorithm to do this tensor decomposition. So you have to tell it how many modes you might want. I said, give me five modes that could explain this fish. Turns out in this particular behavior that suffice to explain about 80% of the tensor variance. So it's actually quite, quite low dimensional in that way. And what you get is a set of weights that capture the different target clusters, the different source clusters, and then this temporal progression. So this is one example mode. If I ask for all five, I get something like this. And what's kind of interesting, you know, if you just kind of try to read the tea leaves a bit, you see some things that ramp, you see some things that burst, you see some things that kind of oscillate, you see different patterns of sources for each of these. But it's, it's kind of hard to see exactly what's happening. And, you know, I, what I like about this pipeline is that it's unsupervised. You make no assumption about the identity of all these neurons before you get to this point. But if you want to try to understand, say, multi-region coordination, maybe it's useful for us to put this into a regional space. So we can essentially back project these cluster weights back onto an anatomical map and we get something like this. So now we're looking for each of these modes at the source weights projected onto the brain of the zebrafish. The more yellow colors are higher kind of contributions to these modes, the darker colors are lower. And then we kind of see that each of these different compositional modes does correspond to a different brain-wide pattern of source contributions. But it tends to not really be region specific, right? It's not like you see this one is the telencephalon and this one is the thalamus, et cetera. There's kind of this, this honking yellow mass up here. This is the telencephalon. It's kind of active in a lot of scenarios. It makes sense. It's kind of cortex-like. So you see that's a major contributor to a lot, but there's also just like diffuse and kind of diverse contributions from all the other regions. But one thing that really stands out to me is this kind of ramp-like thing, right? I showed that this underlying structure was changing on like an hour long time scale. That's roughly the time scale of this ramp-like thing. Then I kind of, for each fish then said, okay, let's look for ramps. So I just correlated this and you can see the R squared here with a linear, just, you know, monotonic line. And then I ranked all of the modes from the five fish by their correlation with that and ended up with something like this, which I thought was quite, quite striking because now we're looking at the top sort of most ramp-like mode of five different individuals with no behavior at all. They're just sitting in this, in this apparatus. And we see really similar motifs emerging across the five fish in this really similar temporal uh, progression. So every fish kind of has this same network or you know, compositional mode happening, which is kind of surprising. 
And then I looked deeper. And this is the data I just showed you, essentially, these ramp-like ones. And you know, you can do some statistics and do some correlations between null distributions and say these are not just like squinting, these are more, more, more similar than I'd expect across individuals. But then I looked closer and you know, there was this kind of slowly undulating thing. And every fish had something kind of like that. And again, like the regions, it's, it's not perfect, but the regions involved are more similar than chance. And then every fish kind of had this fast decaying thing. And again, the regions involved are more similar than chance. And then every fish kind of had this like more slower decaying multi hump thing. And, you know, again, it's, it's a little more similar than chance. So there's really almost this underlying basis set of synchronized structure that's unsupervised I'm finding across all these different individuals. But that doesn't make sense because they're all doing different behaviors. And it turns out that there's essentially one mode that every fish has, which explains all of the individual variability. And here is an example from that first fish. It's this bursting thing that happens to burst every time the fish whips his tail. And here's the other five fish. They all have their own thing happening. And what's interesting is if I just, this, this dashed thing at the bottom is if I just sum the total like whole brain activity, and if I correlate that with the time axis of this fish specific compositional mode, I actually get very high correlations, much higher than all the other modes. So it's basically like the thing you look at and you look at this brain of the fish, this is essentially one little mode that explains 10 to 20% of the fish's variance. And then the other 80% is these really rigid, interesting structure that's almost in, completely internal. You don't even see it in the recordings. Okay, so maybe I'm sure you're all wondering like, what does this mean? And I'm also sure you're wondering, like, is this kind of trivial? Like maybe the algorithm just breaks it off into something and then it adds back together and they all cancel out. So there's a couple of questions we'd want to ask, right? It seems to capture this consistent neurobehavioral structure. One is, is it actually behavior related, right? Can we actually change the compositional modes we find by manipulating something in the animal's behavior? And the second is, is it actually kind of tied to some internal states? So can we change these modes by manipulating the, the fish's brain. So we did some experiments to test both of these uh, questions. So for the behavioral manipulation, what we did was actually, I took the data from that original paper that was published in Cell in 2019 from Aaron's work. And the, you know, but as I mentioned, the fish I've been presenting have, were the control group for, for this experiment. And the real experiment was to actually study their responses to behavioral challenges, so to stress. And essentially the experiment was after some period where the fish were sitting in the, in the, in the dish with the being imaged with nothing happening, they started very lightly electrically shocking the water. So this became like a kind of noxious stimulus that the fish didn't like, but because he's in the water, he can't escape it, right? So the fish is trying to escape from these shocks, but he can't. And what you see is that early on, the fish tries to escape. He has an active coping strategy, but as the stress builds, these fish go into kind of a learned helplessness, depressive like state, and they exhibit this thing called passive coping. So they basically stop moving. And if you look at the fish's behavior, this is the, the change in the number of tail movements they make per minute. Over the course of about an hour, you can see compared to the control group that I analyzed first, these fishes have a pretty substantial change in their behavior. Like they just stop moving. Okay, so now we have essentially the same experimental conditions, but now we have a group where the behavior should be different. So what, what do we find in their compositional modes? So I do the whole RNN fitting procedure. We see the models converge on a similar time course. Everything looks good. We're reconstructing the dynamics. You know, you basically the same as I showed you before. But now whenever we look at an example fish and their compositional modes, we still see a lot of the same kind of structure, something slowly oscillating, some kind of bursting, something decaying, something ramping. But this ramp one is what I'd want to call attention to because here that ramp time course kind of correspond, corresponds to the time course of the fish's sort of depression-like state emerging. And if we do the same analysis for the all five of the shocked fish that we studied, they all have one of these ramping-like modes and they all seem to look quite similar in terms of they have a lot of focus on these eyeball-looking regions, which are actually the habenula. And if we compare that to what I had shown you a few slides ago in the same exact analysis on the control fish, here there's some of that, but it's de-emphasized and there's more of the telencephalon. So we essentially have two groups, one of which was stressed actively, one of which was not. And it almost looks as if they're on some gradient because if you don't know, don't know the habenula, it's implicated a lot in responses to stress and these types of depression-like things. And actually in this experiments, Aaron showed that if you essentially turn on optogenetics 
to activate the habenula, you can immediately induce depression-like states in these fish. So it's basically saying that when you stress the fish, you still get this ramp-like mode, but it is different in all five stressed fish versus all five control fish, but they're similar within cohorts. So there really is some true behavioral relevance is a really interesting structure that we're kind of unpacking here. And then one more manipulation we can do is because this is a depression-like state, the, we, we, they were essentially giving the fish ketamine. So ketamine has some antidepressant properties, but it's also a dissociative drug. So it tends to decouple sort of these sensory motor experiences from our more cognitive uh, states, right? And so the idea is that, okay, if we had this brain and had this brain network and we were studying its, its, its structure, natural, normally you'd be in some, you know, I'm a fish in a tank type state, and then you give it ketamine and then it gets a little bit more dissociative. So what does the brain look like if you give a fish ketamine? Not that different from a normal fish. I mean, maybe this one fires a bit less, but there's also a different fish. So who knows, could be something in the expression. It's, it's hard to say. So we don't see a lot of surface level differences, but we go through the whole pipeline again. We fit our RNN to this ketamine data. We show we can reconstruct the dynamics. You know, we have a pretty low training error. Everything looks good. And then we go and look at these compositional modes. And it's interesting because we almost see like a collapse of the structure. Right, so all five of the modes we find in one of these ketamine fish looks almost exactly the same as all the others. And what we're seeing in this time axis, there's one little detail I didn't tell you. Here I'm only studying six minutes of data because that was the span of recordings we had with these ketamine fish. So it's a much shorter time. It's not an hour, it's six minutes. So this is why some of this temporal uh, stuff looks different from before. So as a, as a comparison, I use the same short time on the control fish. And just to kind of say like, are these brain networks really that different? Like how much has ketamine really changed what we find? I just did a simple analysis where I just multiplied all of the source and target pairs to get an effective like interaction strength and then made turn that into a, you know, 80 dimensional space and then the dimensionality, redu dimensionality reduction with PCA and projected each of these modes into that space. And what that kind of looks like is this, where each dot is a compositional mode uh, I think the legend got lost, but basically the blue colors are the two control groups, a short group and a long group. So the hour long experiment and the six minute long experiment. And then this pink one is the ketamine fish. So basically we're saying across all of the modes we find, there is very consistent structure in these control groups, no matter how much time we look in the short group and the long group. But then we give the fish ketamine and now our states go over here. So we are essentially manipulating the modes we find, but they still remain consistent across the cohort. And we can also look at this similarly with a kind of a chord graph. So the thickness of this line just kind of is a good proxy for the effective connections uh, strength between these nine regions. I won't really go into too much interpretational detail, but what is kind of interesting is that if I compare the two maps normalized between this short time and long time control, there's essentially no difference. Like we're really finding the same kind of distribution of, of source and target regions in these control fish. And then this all kind of gets upended. And what's really cool to me is that in particular, this D DTH and VTH, this is dorsal thalamus and ventral thalamus. We kind of have this over-exaggeration of this dorsal thalamus and habenula pathways and a deregulation of this like a uh, RAFE, RA pathway, which is, I think these types of things would be consistent with a dissociation-like effect of this ketamine drug. So we're finding consistent structure. And we are really using these uh, RNN models to look at what's kind of happening under the hood in this brain-wide circuit. And I think the thing to take away from, from this all is one, I think at scale, you start seeing some interesting things in the brain. If I had an electrode and I recorded from any one of these regions individually, I think it would be hard to really tell what's happening, right? It's, it's actually at the scale where I can see the entire brain that I think the most consistent and interesting structure starts to emerge. And that's because for any given behavior, regardless of the specialization of each region, all of these regions are, are probably gonna be engaged to some degree. So you need the kind of holistic view to even make sense of it. Um, so if you have that view and you do the types of modeling I'm shown here, we can really look at surprisingly preserved structure uh, across individuals. And you can even manipulate these with different experimental things. And just to kind of speculate a bit and tie this back to ideas of AI, you know, I know Blake has sort of talked about neuro foundation models and this kind of thing. Any kind of, kind of model that will allow you to synthesize across individuals or across modalities kind of needs exactly this kind of structure to exist. You need some preserved principle that could allow you to take a data from 
you know, Shab or Andrea or me and like puts us together and actually makes sense of it. And I think that it turns out that that might be easier than we feared in simple models like zebrafish, because it basically turns out that even in a control group, putting them in the microscope is enough of a stressful synchronization event that all of these individuals start to look very, very similar. And then if you do further experiments on top of that, you could see even more. So with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, especially Kanika and Carl and his team. You can read about Curbed, the preprint online or find the code. Uh, and I am hiring in various levels. So if you're interested in this type of neuroanalysis, please find me. Thanks. Hi. Uh, great talk. Thank you so much. Um, so we have time for questions. Um, that, uh, that side, yes. Yes, hello, hi. Um, thanks for the very interesting, interesting presentation. Uh, I have a stupid question first, but I, I'd be very interested to hear your take on uh, how much of an effort it would take to take uh, to take the models that you've trained on this signal to the real world. Like, could you uh, maybe embed them into a virtual zebrafish and see how this uh, zebrafish would evolve in like some simulated or like real world? Yeah, we, we have a lot of interest in that, actually. So I've been talking with Kanika. We call it the meta fish, where we basically take all of the fish we have and try and build like a low degenerative model that can essentially go from behavioral inputs to whole brain activity and then mapping that onto some like simulated environment and seeing if we can kind of what kind of structure we can then find with this analysis. Um, yeah, like an in silico platform to sort of test some behavioral consequence of this types of things. And does it work? Does it move? Oh, we're, we're, we're like working on it now. Yeah, like that's that's like a conceptual level meetings, I'd say we are. Yeah. Hi, uh, uh, great talk. Um, so I work on uh, plasticity in zebrafish, uh, not in, zebra, in Xenopus, sorry. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sort of wondering if um, the curb could be applied to a single region. Yeah. Okay, can just look at it's, cells themselves talking to each other. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's, what's nice about it is that it's completely data agnostic. Like I've used it on spiking data. I've used it on calcium data. I have ideas for even how to use it on EEG, fMRI, and like LFP and ECOG type data. I think it could be quite flexible because essentially you're just any time series that you think you could reasonably model as an RNN, you can fit with this kind of model. And just for the, you know, with this massive whole brain recording, it was kind of, we were designing it to solve that problem of what is this like combinatorics problem, these like N squared possible region interactions, how can we find sensible structure? So from that perspective, I've been discretizing across regions, but if you had one region with different cell types, you could do similar things. If you didn't even want to assume an identity, if you just had one region, you could do this unsupervised tensor decomposition and find latent structure. And that's work in progress like now in my lab, actually. So I'm curious to see how that works. And then one question online. All right. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I, it's quite remarkable what you could do on the with these linear assumptions of of uh, interactions between modules, or um, and I was wondering if you've thought or tried to pepper in some nonlinearities here, right? Yeah. Like in your curb pipeline, you're assuming very simple interactions, and you yeah. you leverage a lot out of this. But there's some really simple things that I'm sure you've thought of of trying, right? Like fit, like deep learn these things, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious to see. Um, yeah, you are there. talking about. Uh exactly what I'm trying to do now. So if you have a student or postdoc who's very interested to collaborate on this, I'm looking for personnel. Yeah, so one of the ideas I was working with a previous uh, uh, lab tech of Konica's, a research assistant of Konica's, uh, and we, were, we had the idea of like doing something like even like VAEs to non-linearly look for this kind of structure in these like maps or something. And it seems promising, but it's, it's not a thing we finished yet. Um, cause right now the, yeah, the only assumption is when we fit these RNNs, I didn't go into the details, but it is like, there's a 10 H, uh, nonlinearity in the update step. So it is also this weird middle ground where we're fitting a nonlinear RNN model, but then we're taking that away and assuming a linear decomposition, which seems to work reasonably well for now, but I'm sure there's many better ways to do it. Yeah. I wonder if you could get away from stitching them together. Uh, mm -hmm. as much if you have nonlinearities there but yeah and it's it's really an issue of when does the dynamics in the network change right because the whole stitching is this this hack essentially to deal with a problem which is 
that the dynamics within the brain are non-stationary and we don't even know the right dimensionality and stuff, right? So if we had a good, if we had a good way of one, identifying some kind of state change in the network, uh, which actually there's a, a preprint called Tracker that from Konica's lab, which I wasn't involved in, but that's the idea is you fit one of these RNNs, then project, like generate, and basically fit it on new data. And when it stops predicting, you say, well, something changed. This is no longer the same dynamical model. Uh, but there's another thing which I'm actively pursuing, which I think would be very powerful is here. I was completely ag agnostic to what was happening in the world or what we knew about the zebrafish, right? It's, here's our, here's neural data, fit this RNN. But there's a lot of confounds there, right? Like the whipping of a fish's tail, the light that he sees, the, the time in the experiment, the hunger level, like there's all these things that could be actually have a lot of explanatory power in the data that right now is just kind of being randomly assigned to the weights that the network finds for that kind of thing. So one of the things I'm working on now is actually to add these external constraints in addition to the neural constraints of the networks that can kind of sop up whatever covariance they can and then get a finer grained view into the actual neural interactions. And the hope there is certainly that we, things that looked like a state change that were actually externally driven by some input, we would no longer, we would be able to natively account for within the same dynamical model. Thank you. Um, we'll go with one online question, please. Okay. Um, we have a question from Yashua Bengio uh, and also a general comment. Um, his question is, does the RNN reproducing the fish data also generalize well on out of sample recordings? Uh, and there's an additional comment that instead of having a separate set of weights for each of the eight blocks of six minutes, you could share the same weights, but learn some underlying latent state that is not measured, but is allowed to change slowly with time. Yeah, so the that's that's my aim one of the NSERC I submitted this year is essentially that last comment. Um, yeah. In, in different forms. So I think it's a great idea and that's absolutely the kind of direction that I need to go. Uh, in terms of the, what was the first question? The generalizability. generalizability. Yeah, so this is a thing that we're, that I've been beating my head against for a couple of years now because it, the short answer is it generally generalizes poorly. The long answer is it almost has to the way we've set up the problem because it is fit directly to the data. So unless you know that the generalization set has exactly the same statistics and dynamics, it's going to generalize poorly. But in these fish, for example, the states are kind of always drifting for various reasons. And we, we're trying to use the model to infer those drifts, which also means we can't use the model to generalize outside of what we've trained on. So this is, I mean, really like Yum's comment, this is exactly why we want to start incorporating things like behavioral states or time and basically finding ways to make this generalized better. But I will say that if you can set up the problem, like these are very longitudinal studies. If you set up the problem in a bit more of a classic sense where like, let's say it's a monkey making reaching movements and I have a thousand trials. If I train these RNNs on 900 of them and test on the last hundred, it does pretty well, maybe like 80, 60 to 80% of, of the, you know, within domain performance. So it's not nothing, but it could be better. So yeah, but active areas of research. One last question, Joel. Um, but my question is about regularization, and just because you're you're so heavily interpreting like learned connectivity, it seems like at least considering something like L1 yep. regularization might be worthwhile. And I'm curious about whether you've looked into that or not, and and if so, what you uh, what you've seen. Yeah, that's another active area of research. So we have a version of the training rule with uh, L1 norm um, in the cost function, and. It's, it turns out that with the way we're training this, it's a bit harder to get the network to converge to a stable dynamical solutions. The idea is you have this kind of chaotic network from random connectivity, and then you essentially just like constrain the dynamics to get these really stable solutions. And right now with just the simple rule, no regularization, this works just about every time. But like you said, it can be hard to interpret. Uh, with the regularization, just the, the little bit we have tried, half the time it converges pretty well, half the time it just explodes and never actually finds a solution. So we just don't know yet what we're doing kind of wrong or what we could add. Like I'm sure there there is a way to get this to work and maybe we have to kind of ditch the recursive blue squares thing in the end and do like backprop or something. But there should be a way, it's just that we haven't found it yet. But yeah, we, absolutely we want to go that way. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.